Hello, everyone, and welcome to our round table on the future of the history of science field. Um, I'm Simon Schaffer, and I'll be the host for today's discussion. I'm a professor of the history of science in the University of Cambridge, and I co-edit the Cambridge University Press series, Science in History. Um, let me start by introducing our eminent and distinguished panelists who are distributed across the planet. Um, Ofer Gal, wave Ofer, thank you, um, is professor of history and philosophy of science at the University of Sydney. He's the author of the recently published and highly important textbook, The Origins of Modern Science. We also have Projit Mukherjee, um, who is Associate Professor in the University of Pennsylvania, and Gabriela Soto Laveaga, who's Professor of History of Science at Harvard. They're both co editors of a new, I mean, it could barely be newer, uh, Cambridge Element series Global Histories of Science, Medicine, and Technology. Now, before we start, I have a couple of quick notices. The first is about the format of the discussion. Each of the panelists, each of the three panelists, is going to give their initial thoughts on the theme, on the prospects for the history of science. Um, and then we'll move on to a general discussion. Um, I'll ask a few of my own questions because I'm spoiled and I'll share your questions as well with the panelists. Um, in order to submit your questions, you click on the Q&A icon on the black bar at the bottom of the screen and type in the window that pops up. I should also remind you that this webinar is being recorded and the video will be shared on the Cambridge University Press YouTube channel. Um, Cambridge University Press Academic, that will happen in the next few days, uh, God willing. So let me start with inviting Ofer, welcome to give us five minutes or so of his thoughts on the future of the field of history of science. All fair. Thanks a lot, uh, Simon, and thanks to the Cambridge University Press for this uh, so, in so important uh, meeting. And uh, because of the shortness of time, I wrote my stuff down. I, I apologize for uh, reading it, but uh, hopefully I can be more spontaneous later if the big questions, so I read it. So I came out of philosophy and psychology and chose history of science in the late 80s because it was the most reflective and hence the, and the most conscious, hence most uh, sophisticated of all disciplines I knew. Granted, it was young, I was also, it was small and elitist discipline with a great interest in itself. It had a clear canon of primary and secondary literature and a clear grand narrative against one uh, could rebel without lo losing focus or purpose of the actual uh, uh, historical work. Then over these last three plus decades, history of science grew exponentially. Lots of dissertation covering lots of topics, many of them new, with lots of self-confidence. There is a great feeling of affirmation, for, you know, people my age in it. The discipline has come to its own, but it comes at a price. And the price is that many of the complex epistemological, historiographical, and even ethical questions that drew people of my generation to the discipline seems to have been, to use again a, a term from the, those times, black boxed. For us, there is a sense of a loss in, in that we no longer have those great debates of yore. Uh, nor are new ones emerging from these uh, brave new topics and the uh, approaches of of now. Uh, 
this was the drive behind writing the the book that uh, uh, that Simon over uh, over introduced. Uh, behind writing a, a synthetic, wide-ranging introductory book. It was not to summarize what we think we know about the earlier stages of the coming to being of science, but to return to discussing these philosophical questions and doing so in the one way I think is valid, namely through the way one structures the historical narrative. So I'll, I'll quickly give two related examples uh, of what I mean, examples of the questions, not necessarily of the, of the answers. Uh, the first is that we have all been recently convinced that history of science, perhaps all histories, must be global. This is very reasonable. Uh, why should the people of one rainy corner of the globe get all the attention? Uh, the problem is that one of the most important insights of the work, you know, again, the drew me in work of Simon and people like him was to convince us that all knowledge is local and, and the science just, just, just so. Science is local. That is, this was really a crucial insight for, for this uh, uh, expediency of new histories of science because it was this locality that allowed us to do real history of science. Not that all the historia sacra of the great march towards truth, but the contingent human story of the uh, rise of some particular cultural phenomenon, a specific set of practices and beliefs that did manage to globalize itself, true, but was never universal. So how does one reconcile these two seemingly contradictory insights between locality and globality? We shouldn't be afraid of such a question. Uh, my book has a section that is uh, brazenly called global knowledge. And I once uh, even argued that the scientific revolution itself, in a sense, is a global phenomenon. But I'd like to see us returning to discussing these questions, discussing these questions explicitly, questions like this, that this tension between the strive to globality and the acknowledgement of locality. Uh, and closely related is the question, what do we call science? What is science? What's our subject matter? Again, the great achievement that allowed this prosperity of histories of science is the insight is that science is just this, just that thing that one finds in faculties of science, a package deal of unquestioned ontological assumption, epistemological do's and don'ts, ancient religious institutions, white robes, white boards, and so forth. But the ethical drive, and I think it's primarily an ethical drive to do global histories also seems to drive us to use science expensively and inclusively. We have a Chinese science, an Indian science, an Aborigine science. This is understandable and in some senses commendable. It really is good to be the final farewell to the nonsense of the West and the rest. But do is, doing so, don't we lose insight of, a, the, sorry, don't we lose the insight of the particularity of science and return circuitously <laughs> to the use of science as a term of adulation instead of a proper name. And in that, do we really give proper attention to the particularities of those other forms of knowledge? Uh, and, and or do we end up returning to this, you know, to the pre-revolution uh, in history of science, where we deciphering all forms of knowledge according to this alien mores of one particular form of foreign to them knowledge that is science. In the book, for example, this kind of, um, of a questioning, this kind of um, wavering uh, made for a really interesting challenge of how to write history of magic and how to, uh, on the one hand, relate it and on the other hand, distinguish it from science. Whether I succeeded or not, or not, sorry, whether I succeeded or not is of lesser importance. But what I hope the, the, the discipline will return to do is to discuss such question boldly, explicitly, like we used to do when the world was young and not everything had a name. Thank you. Ah. Um, and you're the only Gabriella, name you have. Uh, 
perhaps you'd like now to pick up the baton. That would be lovely. So thank you so much, Simon. Um, and I also wish to thank uh, Cambridge University Press for organizing this. And to answer uh, Simon's provocation when he asked us, what are your thoughts on the future of the history of science? I, I did a really um, basic exercise and I went to the program of the recent History of Science conference. And it was really interesting to see some of the panels there. Many of them began with rethinking, re-examining new perspectives, reconstructing non-traditional methods, putting race into data, histories of science in the Caribbean. So if we were to look at what the future of the history of science looks like, I think this is a good place to begin, but it isn't a good place to end because I think the recent program is really a provocation of, and really a reflection of how exciting the field of history of science is right now. We're really going, I feel, we're at this moment where the field of history of science is having a moment of introspection to try to decide where we're headed, but also where we've come from and where we are currently in the present as a field, but also as historians. And it's not surprising that this is happening because in many ways we are mirroring what is happening around global societies in which society as a whole is asking where have some of, why have we excluded some of these groups from larger society? Where have these stories emerged? Why have these stories been erased? And in some ways, I think those um, questions are being reflected in the work that is currently being done as we saw just two weeks weeks ago in, in, our, in our professional meeting. So I think what's happening and in conversation with, with what Ofer just said, I think we are moving beyond these grand narratives, macro histories and highlighting more of the micro histories, but this isn't necessarily histories of national science because I think we are moving beyond that as well. What we're looking at is looking at regional histories that connect at a global scale. So it's not just um, a, a specific national history that uses science as a lens from which to tell a national story, but rather to use science as a way to understand a nation and using this as a, as a global scope. So it's not, so what I wanna say there is that it's not just about simply incorporating new geographies, and new chronologies, what we need to do is really question why we are bringing in these new geographies and these new chronologies and, admit, and admitting to ourselves that we can't use the same measures nor the same storytelling tools that we have been using when we're using, when we're looking at these new chronologies and new geographies. It's not, sim not simply, um, as I said in an, in an earlier article, it's not simply decentering narratives but it's about openly discussing the power imbalance about the construction of history. So when we as historians of science acknowledge that there has been an imbalance when um, how archives are preserved, what archives are preserved, what voices are preserved from that get-go, then that means that we've already started to retell new histories of science. It's understanding difference on its own terms, not simply making visible but validating experiences that we may not have been contending with. So this is where I feel that this is why I began by saying, we're in a really exciting time and a really engaging moment for the discipline because we have to learn to speak in a multiplicity of languages and incorporate a multiplicity of experiences that have not been present in how we understand history of science. And I think going forward, if we just look at the program, how rich and how lucky we are to be in our field at this moment. Thank you so much, Simon. Thank you, Gabriella. Um, Projit. Thank you, Simon. And uh, thanks to all the audience and thanks to Cambridge University Press for bringing us together. Um, so I think I, I, I've often, of course, pondered on some of the questions that offer throughout amongst them, what is science today? Like, what do we understand to be science? And I go back to, as I said, what is, what is it that is called science in the universities? What's being taught there? What can you get a degree that is called a BSc for? Uh, 
Um, and this, of course, differs depending on which university you go to. If uh, you went to a university in my country, in India, you could get a degree in Ayurveda, and that would be a BSc degree. You could also get a degree in a bunch of other things, like there's a new discipline called Ayur Genomics, which I'm sure many of you have never heard of. You can get a BSc degree in that. Now, where does this, where, where do we fit this in? Is this like, of course, maybe for those of you in Australia or those of you in the UK, you've never even heard of these disciplines. Uh, so should we leave these out of history of science because you haven't heard of it? Or should we write about it because it is being taught in universities and being called science there? And India, as everybody already knows, to repeat the banal, is not a small place. By 2030, it's slated to be the most populous country in the world. So I think it does matter. Um, and so from that, I would say that, and it is indeed like my uh, previous monograph had been on the hi history of modern Ayurveda, uh, not Ayurveda in the Vedic times or in some classical period, but in the modern world as it exists now. And the first time I tried to send a proposal for this to a, a history of science book series, the editor wrote back within half an hour, to say that this seems like a book for the area studies series. Here's our area studies editor. So that's the kind of frame within which I uh, come to this conversation. Um, I think one of the things that it has made me realize as somebody who works on things like Ayurveda, which uh, are legitimate legally recognized sciences in my country, but do not qualify as science in many other places, is that um, we, the way we've thought of the global thus far has been traditionally, it used to be a kind of uh, centrifugal idea of dissemination, that there's, there was modern science somewhere in the center and it spread out from there. Then we move to these narratives of global collection, that things were always uh, collected, data was collected elsewhere, skills were collected elsewhere and brought back to centers of calculation. It was a centripetal model of the globe. But what is lost in that is, I think, a uh, uh, idea of heterogeneously different sciences, the sciences that don't necessarily come together, but remain apart, but co continue to coexist in the same present. Um, and this brings me to the final point I want to make, which is that I, I agree that all knowledge is local but depends on which local we are talking about and which universal we are talking about. So along with locality and globality, I would throw in plurality as well, because there's not one way of being universal. I mean, Christendom was an imagination of universalism. So was the global umma. And so were many different, and I'm just falling back on religious universalisms, but there are multiple scientific universalisms as well. And these, and some of them, particularly in Asia, I think, are very overtly um, post-Western. And what I mean by post-Western universalism is that it's not non-Western or anti-Western, but it says that whatever has been, this is a very familiar trope to anybody who works on China or India, to say that anything the West has discovered, we discovered 5,000 years ago. Whether that is true or not is a different question. But I think that claim itself gestures to a post-Western universalism, which shows that we are compete in some kind of uh, competition coexistence with the West, and we are trying to fabricate an universalism, but that universalism does not center the 17th century in Europe as its fulcrum. It centers other histories, other pasts, and other narratives. So I think for me, the history of the future of the history of science has to be one that recognizes that there are there's more than one way of being universal and that there are these competing universalisms which uh, may not necessarily come together either at centers of calculation or out in whatever disseminatory periphery it is but they coexist they compete sometimes they collaborate sometimes they don't and for me that's what the future of history of science has to take so but I look forward to other questions and discussion. Thanks. That's all magnificent. Thank you so much. Thank you in particular for taking uh, a drone's eye view of some of the prospects of the field, right? Um, in the next few minutes, I have the delightful and extremely self-indulgent task of asking my own questions, right? So 
I'm going to exploit that by proposing two hypotheses, and I want to know what you think on the basis of what the three of you have so cleverly and astutely sketched. One is the following. It's an absolutely characteristic feature of historians of the sciences, technology and medicine, especially over the recent period that, and here I absolutely agree with Gabriella, we are in, I think, the most exciting period of the field, certainly in my career. Um, it's a characteristic feature of the field that it advances when it engages in figure ground reversal, when it precisely calls into question what seems completely self-evident and takes for granted what everybody else is worried about. So I'll take my inspiration for the question from Gabriella's, the title of Gabriella's second book which as we all know is called Sanitizing Rebellion. And that's a fantastic description of where the history of science and medicine is. The function of the sciences, one could argue, is to sanitize rebellion, precisely, um, by canonizing what is new, by writing a hagiography of insurrection. And one of the implications of that, precisely, is that what historians of science should spend their time thinking about, this is the line that Project has emphasized in what he's just told us, is that we need to pay a lot of attention to wall building, to barrier construction, to what my colleague Sujit Siva Sundaram calls islanding. Up till now, historians of science have been obsessed to distraction with issues like universalization, globalization, how what works in one place works elsewhere, how it comes to pass that the problem of induction can't be solved epistemically, but it can apparently be solved geographically. All of those have been our stock in trade. Well, now, folks, we're facing the opposite problem. We're facing the opposite problem about vaccines. We're facing the opposite problem about scientific communication. We're facing the exactly opposite problem about scientific disciplines, as Project, I think, very astutely reminds us of. There is a modern scientific Ayurveda which works there and it doesn't work here. And that's the explanando. So what could the future of the history of science as a field be if its fundamental question was not centrifugal, was not expansive, was not universalizing, was not the production of uniformity, but the relentless insistence, appalling in all sorts of ways, on difference, on distinction, on precisely as Ophir reminds us, on the local. This is not now the local as source, but the local as goal. Is that not where the problem of the sciences is going? And what would the history of science be if that was the problem? What do you think, if anything? Oh, fair. It seems to me that it seems to me that the 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 question of the, the two the question of globalization and localization are obviously uh, related, and the, I mean, in a sense, uh, they always well they were they were since we started notice we replaced. The, the idea of uh, universal with the idea of uh, of uh, like project nicely put it center and periphery the question how you set the center was a question of how you set the center right the question of what counts as center and periphery 
was not just a question how the royal society draws everything in, but how it makes sure that it's drawn only here. And we are the only one that get to say um, what counts. So, so uh, fair enough. I mean, uh, this, this, uh, there is a, um, uh, there is a give and take or, um, or, a, or a commonality between strategies of, uh, of, uh, of globalization. One of them is to call it universalization, right? Say, oh, well, the Chinese finally realized that this is the right way to do things. Uh, and, the, and the question of uh, what is it for them to realize how to do things is to realize that we are the one that counts, right? So the, the, there is a, the, these 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 questions are uh, are uh, you know flip sides of the same um, of the same um, issue, but I, I want to push a project a little. If you, I'm, I, I was really moved by what you said. Just by by way of provocation, don't we? If we go the way you you suggest, end up letting uh, politicians that use the term uh, of science as, a, as, a, as an adulation, right? As a self-complementary uh, uh, term uh, set for us what counts, right? So if uh, the universities here or there want to, to call it, okay, so that's now become, to call it this or that, that now becomes our question. What is this and what is that? Project, <laughs> answer can... that and then Gabriella. Sure, I'll try to be very brief so that Gabriela can have a say. Um, I would just say that it's it's not, I mean, I wish the politicians read anything I wrote, but I doubt anybody, even, even my mother probably doesn't read what I write. So, so I'm, I'm kind, kind of, it's not up to me to, uh, to police them, but I think a historian's task, so far as it is to describe what is, happening in society or what has happened in society and how we have, how that has changed, we're always at the mercy of politicians and kings and people like that because they have the power and I want to make a plug for that. And I think that we need to uh, can reconnect history of science more with histories of politics and, and precisely because of this, because where a term, what is considered science where, it may, may not be just in one nation, it might be bigger than a nation, but it is seldom all nations. It, it's a matter of politics. It's a matter of where, what laws apply, whether two states or more than two states have signed on to some global treaty to allow certain common laws to apply to them. So I think there's no getting away from the politicians. We might hate them and we might hate what they're doing, but the fact that the politicians in my country can create, create higher genomics, whether you believe in it or not, is now a huge discipline that has a hugely well-funded laboratory in Delhi and elsewhere with lots of people, scientists, properly accredited, accredited scientists who are working in this, publishing papers in international journals, etc. So what do we do? We can't, I mean, that is the reality that's happening. I might not like it. I might personally feel that it's quackery. I feel a lot of like, what we consider mainstream science is also quite I mean, people were singing Whitey on the Moon when others were trying to uh, put like men on the moon. So it depends on what you consider legitimate and why or not. But the truth is that the state is investing and the state to the extent that it has the capacity to make laws and make particular signs and practices legible and legal and others illegal and illegible, um, we have to deal with them. <laughs> so. I, I agree with you, but I think that is that is what a historian does. They <laughs> describe, even if it is an e evil king, we describe what that king did, that the king had power to make certain laws and that law changed people's lives. I think especially, Gabriella. So I do want to answer your question, Simon, but I do want to follow up with something that Projit said at the end that reminded me, um, of how science can be co-constructed in a national setting. And this reminded me of the attempt of the Mexican government to um, track the Mexican genome and to try to identify who was really Mexican, completely forgetting that 
the identity of a Mexican is a made up national. Uh, uh, so giving this scientific heft to something that does not really exist, but creating in this an area of exclusion where those who could be identified genetically as Mexican and those who could not be identified genetically as Mexican, of course, who were the indigenous. So it goes into these interesting questions of who is, uh, how science with capital S is being used and how we as historians tell those histories by untangling what we understand as being science. And um, so thanks Projit for mentioning that because that triggered that memory. And just very quickly, Simon, to, to answer your, um, your question, which I loved. And I hope I'm now remembering the question because I was so engaged with what Projit was saying. It's but... about walls and in particular, Prof, it's about sanitizing rebellion. Well, thank you so much for mentioning that. And when you were speaking, what it reminded me of, and maybe because I'm just so immersed right now in the world of development aid, but when we think of mid 20th century projects, and in particular how technocrats from the North saw the rest of the globe, it was a universalizing concept, be it with agriculture, be it with hydraulic power, the building of dams, infrastructure, which at the moment seemed miraculous, and it seemed as if the power of science and engineering and technology could solve all problems. But it's with the passage of time that we see the erosion of soil, as in the case of the hybrid seeds that I'm working with now, and that these universal, universalizing solutions by not taking into account local ecologies, but local ways of understanding the environment ultimately created more harm than good. So how to, so to go around and answer your question, it's this interesting quest to try to respect local knowledges and understand difference and not by creating more difference so that there's a lack of conversation between the multiple centers and the multiple peripheries. But I think what we need to be doing in reconstructing this, this unsanitized rebellion and is to really take into consideration that there isn't a single history, there isn't a single, there's a multiplicity of stories, as uh, Marisol de la Cadena and others have said, a world of worlds. Yeah. And how do we describe, how do we describe this world of worlds when we're speaking about histories of science? And it's these multiple layers. And I'll, I'll just leave it there because I know Projit has something more to say. He does have something more to say, I can tell. Oh. <laughs> no, I was just going to say that in terms of building walls, I'm, I mean, that always scares me. I, I lived through the Trump years in America, so walls are scary, <laughs> very scary things. But, uh, but I, I do think that rather than us building the walls, perhaps, and that's what I was trying to say in response to Ofer, that uh, we need to pay more attention to the histories of law and histories of politics um, in uh, writing the history of science because the walls are being built by others that then um, produces effects which uh, about what kind of knowledge is, what kind of skills, what kind of people can move where and what is legible, what is recognized where. I would also, I am instinctively and again as an Indian um, and as somebody who is critical of the current Indian government uh, which has made a virtue out of sort of a kind of essentialism that, uh, which is not like, they're not unique in that. We see this across the world now, this kind of populism that is turning a, a sort of a essentialized identity of the local into uh, a bulwark of right-wing politics. I, I'm also hesitant to use the local without scare quotes. And I think we should also think of like how the local became local. Like what's, there's a history to, the why something is local. And that again goes to some, some earlier walls, which might have disappeared now, but once existed, which has bounded something as the local. Um, so I think for me, it's not so much that I want to build the walls, but I want to engage with the histories of walls, both those that have collapsed and those that are in the process of coming up as part of history of science. I think that's extremely well put. I mean, that's, one of the reasons I wanted to press on issues of localizing, of islanding, 
and so on, precisely because it raises such interesting questions, I think, not only about the future of the history of science, but also obviously about the history of the history of science. Right? That's already getting pretty self-indulgent. The complementary question then, I'm only allowed two questions, so I'm squeezing this for all I can you know, get away with, um, is we've been invited to reflect with each other about prospects for the field of the history of science. So let's put a little more stress following Ofer's intervention on the category of science, right? Uh, to be the devil's advocate, almost nothing any of us have said so far seems specific to the sciences. Most everything that we've been saying to each other in the last half hour seems perhaps to be, I think, valuable and important and significant observations about the predicament of history in general, right? So I would want to ask, does any of you think, frankly, that there's something specific that the very phrase, the very expression, history of science, rather than a certain historical attitude in our current crisis involves? And if so, what is it? And what will it be? Not what should it be? What will it be? Right? And just to sharpen your wits even more than they are. Um, this is how Ofer's book ends. I'm just going to embarrass him by reading out this phrase. Ofer's book ends with an evocation of the construction of the Cathedral of Modern Science at the end of the 1600s. Modern science had its cathedral, incomplete, asymmetric, its divine aspirations never fully hiding the traces of its human makers, an object to marvel at, emulate, enhance, and reshape. Now I submit that it is extremely unlikely that any textbook in any other field of history now would end like that. So is that what's specific to our field? If so, not what? Tell me what we're doing. Any of you? Oh, I, okay. I just embarrassed you by, I mean, I hope I didn't embarrass you by reading out that me. extremely you, beautiful piece of writing. The great Simon Schaeffer has quoted my last word. How can <laughs> that be? No, I, you did not embarrass me. But it was interesting kind of thing. I mean, it's a really uh, okay. self-alienation. I, I, I just offer it up, right? So, so, so I'll say something about this, about, you know, the, this is kind of how back to the introduction of this book, of this idea of science as a, as a human, uh, uh, as a human achievement, right? That is, uh, is being built, not, not on the way to some place, but it's always, it's not, it's not guided by what's there, but what, what was done, which is, by the way, again, we discussed a little, our students, completely impossible to get across to them, to think of science as a human thing. This is what we do. This just happens to be what we do. And, and, uh, and uh, the, this, uh, this particular quotation is about where the book ends, which is that the uh, Newton Spring Keeper. And, uh, uh, you know, the great cathedral of early modern science. And, and that's in, and, and in answer also to in, in, in dialogue with what uh, Projit and Gabriela said, what where is what you said as a what you Simon just said as a as a like a teaser, I treat a little as a, a bit of a worry. I think there is a point where you do talk just about those particular skills. So you want to to, uh, to talk about a modern Ayurveda 
you know, modernized Ayurveda in, in, uh, in, uh, in India, by all means. I mean, you want to put it under history of science? We won't fight about, uh, about titles, but please show me what the, they do. And what they do for me, not in order to get, it's not, again, it's not a term of adulation. If there is a point to call it science, let's see. Here is what we do. Here is what scientists do. Those those uh, um, uh, um, practitioners there in uh, I don't know the universities of India. Do they pre behave like scientists? Uh, maybe they do in in uh, in behave like scientists in the sense of previous, right? In the sense of the history of science. Do they wear white robes? Do they uh, use uh, do they use uh, 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 mathematics? What do they take and what do, don't they take? So again, that's that's what I, I found myself doing with magic. That how do you write about magic? You don't want to write about magic as science because that's not good for magic and not good for science. You're not telling history of magic. But they met and they separated and sometimes they uh, they they uh, shared and sometimes they competed badly. But the, I you know that's a, like a sentence that I missed from my reading. I'm very much for a rather minimalist use of, of the word, not in order to give it some, some particularity, right? So some, some, not so, some, some um, a grandeur, which it shouldn't have, but just for the sake of doing this kind of human history of it. Human meaning everything new is done by resource, everything that is being done ahead is done on the basis of what you have in your present and your past. And, and, and to let kind of uh, something weave some particular set of practices and, uh, and uh, uh, bits of knowledge and bits of presumptions, ontological and epistemological, to see how they come to be in their specificity. I hope I said something coherent. No, you, you absolutely did. Um, before Project responds and then Gabriella, and then we'll open it up, I just want to remind us that Project has major interests in parapsychology, in the history of enchantment. I mean, he's a serious historian of magic. Right? So you have touched on a nerve there, Olga, I have to say. Project. Yeah, I was I was tempted to bring that up in terms of like the history of magic I'm interested in is again when there was a brief period in post-colonial India when university departments were studying reincarnation. What do we do with that? That's like you can't leave that out of that's not like the rise of science and the decline of magic. That's something else happening there. So anyway, but that that aside, I think. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm embarrassed to say that I haven't read Ofer's book as yet, so I will definitely read it and be in a better position to respond to the metaphor. Uh, but I'd say this much, that how, how do scientists behave? Do they behave like scientists? Well, of course, if we've read Leviathan and the Air Pump or anything else, we know that that has a lot to do with cathedrals and churches and not just as metaphors. And so if we want all the Indian scientists to suddenly behave like that, well, they don't because they don't go to churches and cathedrals. They might go to temples and mosques. Um, there are people, sociologists who are working on this now that how there's a lot of ritual practice in laboratories and not just Ayurvedic laboratories, in laboratories where the human genome was being mapped, for instance, at IISC Bangalore, and not the local genomes, the, the, when we thought there was a single genome, uh, it seems 20 years ago. This uh, is Rennie Thomas's work, yeah? Yeah, 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 absolutely, Rennie Thomas's work. So, um, so, uh, so we, we do know that there's a lot of, so again, religion is another factor of how that is playing out, not just at the level of metaphors, but also invocation of particular histories, particular imagery, particular modes of ethical practice in the laboratory. Uh, the way I think of history of science being distinctive though, is that when I talk to colleagues in straight up history departments, I see they take a lot of things as, uh, for instance, they'll take economic data for granted often. Um, and then 
create an explanation on the basis of that. And I'm always wondering, how do you know this? What economic models were used? So the way I describe it to my students is that historians of science are always interested in how we know what we know and what's the history of that knowing. Um, and that seems to be somewhat distinctive from the larger field of history, where a lot of this factual stuff is taken for granted. Um, and that's why it's so difficult for historians of science to write about climate change, because we get caught up about not just that, oh, climate change is happening, we know, but like, how do we know that? And what are the models that are being used? So, um, so I would say that that's where I put my money, that that's the distinctive bit I think historians of science do. Um, and But the ways of knowing are infinitely varied for me. And they're not, there is no one template for being and behaving like a scientist. There are different ways of being and behaving like scientists um, and different ways of knowing. Not all of them even always acknowledge the human madeness of it. I might impute it, but a lot of, and this you see also from the people pushing back with indigenous studies now, that the, saying that a lot of it may not be, you, that's a presumption that it's all human made. Why should we accept that? Um, I'm not, I'm agnostic about this, but I'm saying that this is, again, if I describe what my actors do, many of them would say that it, oh, this wasn't in the scientific revolution, this was already in the Vedas, and the Vedas were divinely revealed. And then what do I do? If that person is publishing in nature and is a <laughs> straight up mainstream scientist, but believes that part of his intellectual apparatus derives from a divinely revealed text, well, <laughs> as a historian, and that's why I also, like Ofer, started out trying to be a philosopher and then left because I thought that being a historian was uh, in a way more interesting, but also a little, it hedged my bets. I could just describe what the actors were doing, uh, which is what I still try to do. But enough said. Uh, no, that's, that, that's very astute. Thank you so much. Gabriella. So um, thank you for reading that uh, final sentence. Really makes me want to go and read the rest of Ofer's work because that was just simply beautiful. And it reminds me that often when we think of the cathedrals of the history of science, they tend to be these spaces of knowledge making or at least how we've grown to understand where knowledge takes place and where knowledge is made, be they universities, be they laboratories or monasteries, but it also reveals a lot of the chronology that we have used to try to understand what history of science is and not just the, the which tends to be a very Eurocentric chronology or how we understand time. So if we're using this linear understanding of time, of course our cathedrals of knowledge are going to be these, these spaces in which we understand the white coat wearing, that scientists wear the white coats. But if we move those bookends of time, and if we move those bookends of geographies, the cathedrals of knowledge cease to be universities and they cease to be laboratories. That does not mean that knowledge making is not happening. And that does not mean that that isn't history of science because it's not happening within these spaces as we all know. But I think what we need to contend with what history of science is or what history of science might be becoming is this um, communication, this dialogue that needs to take into consideration the multiple ways of knowledge making that have existed and that have not been taken into account because they don't fit the frame of being within that, that architectural frame or metaphor, architectural metaphor of the cathedral of science. So for me, what the history of science is, is engaging with what we understand to be um, the traditional forms of knowledge making and engaging it with ways that we have not yet considered on an equal valence as knowledge producing. And in that gray area, that to me, for me personally is the most exciting because then we can begin to understand where um, conversations have sh passed each other like ships in the night or misunderstandings have happened, but it's also where I feel that we can understand, for example, how a physicist might understand the universe. And whereas uh, someone in the Yaki and Sonora might explain the relationship between the moon and the sun and 
the tides of, of water, however it may be. How do we build that? And can we understand that to be history of science? And I think that is where we are right now. How do no, we bring these multiple knowledge makings into bravo, together? Bravo, bravo, yeah. So one reason I wanted to read out the passage about cathedral building was because it's about building. Forget about the bloody cathedrals. You know. um, and that raises a question. I hope this is a seamless transition, but I don't think this is going to work, but we'll try. Um, this raises a question that at least two members of our audience have raised, which is a question about technology. It's not the question concerning technology, because I would censor that. Um, this is a question about technology. On the one hand, Ian Wills writes this. So far, says Ian, we've spoken almost exclusively about history of science. He asks, where does the history of technology fit into this? And he asks, because he often feels history of technology is the poor relation to science. And Martin Brown asks a not unrelated question, but a question which brings the politics and the historiography of that issue to the fore. Is populist technocracy, which we did talk about very briefly en passant, a new form of wall building? protecting local elites in power and against citizen and democratizing scientific practice and decision-making. So we're invited by our audience to reflect briefly, briefly on the status of the history of technology with respect to the history of science, on whether that makes any difference on technocracy in particular, which obviously presses enormously in South Asia and in Mexico, amongst all the other places that it presses. Um, and I just invite you to think about that. I know you've all thought about these issues and I'm wittering on just to give you that extra 90 seconds so that you can now answer with pith and wit. So project, technocracy, how does that fit into the story that you just told us about Ayurvedic genomics, for example? So I would say that in, in my, where I'm at, at present personally in my mind is that Science, modern science, uh, at least in South Asia, has been a massive technology of alienation. Alienation of uh, elites from subalterns, alienation of particular forms of being in the world, alienation of particular forms of knowledge, because it has authorized the rise and the validation of certain forms of knowledge. And so I think uh, that uh, science itself is a technology um, for alienation and the te and technocracy is the is a really amped up version of that where that connection between alienation and political power is more intimate and the powers of alienation that were previously maybe discursive um, or ideological or hegemonic have now acquired an actual applied uh, possible, a set of possibilities through the, um, and that's, that's for me. So for me, the difference between history of science and history of technology has never been super well defined. I think they bleed into one another all the time, but an interest in technology for me personally has gone with a greater interest in material practices, in, in material objects and such. And to that extent, I think science generally has operated as a technology of alienation, but if you focus on technology per se, the technology and technocracy part of it, it's the most amped up version of that alienating machine. That's a really interesting way of putting it. Gabriella, what do you think about that specifically? I think that question of technocracy, especially right now in our, in our time, is a really interesting one. Um, in particular, if we're thinking about uh, the space that I'm most familiar with, which is Mexico, the, the current administration 
has been very anti-science and has targeted scientists and uh, has targeted thinkers in society, while at the same time espousing a love of technology. And so this contradiction is playing out- You in mean the Obrador? Yes, the Lopez Obrador administration, the, or AMLO as, as he's commonly known. Yeah, and um, this is a really interesting contradiction, this um, targeting of scientists while at the same time embracing what the administration defines as modern technologies. And it began, um, and, and this is just very quick, uh, Mexico was, was building what was meant to be the largest airport in the world. And it was going to take 90 years from the point of beginning to when it would end, where it would be completed. I believe it was going to be like 2090. And um, they were building, the, and they, uh, <laughs> like three mountains were destroyed. It was built up to 33% capacity. I mean, they created an entire, basically microclimate. So much construction was taking place. But as part of AMLO's a presidential bid, they targeted the airport as an elitist project and as a site of corruption, linking irreversibly science to corruption and technology and knowledge making in particular to what was gonna be this site. And I could go on and on about that example, but the point I want to make there is that technocracy in a space like Mexico takes on a very interesting um, color when you team it with someone who calls himself a populist. And in particular, when technology is seen to be a dividing force that can provide good for the poor because the rich have overly prospered from it. This is a really dangerous way of That's, using yes. okay. technology. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm so. Yes, so I, I think um, Martin, that would be the way I would respond to that one, that um, it depends on whom you consider a populist and what that populist is leaning on or how that populist is defining technology. Super. Oh, fair. I'll take you to some other place if you don't, this, uh, the answer, mainly because Ian knows my regular answers to that. Uh, the, uh, it occurred to me some completely surprisingly now in the last 10 minutes, that in, in some sense, the distinction between us as you know, members of the same uh, uh, discipline is uh, how far back do we go uh, to start calling it history? And, and the question is, does it really, is it really important to tell stories of stuff that happened, never mind 300 years ago, 2,500 years ago? If you think it's worth telling stories, it's interesting to tell stories of 1,500 years ago, then, then it's almost by, by the, unless you go far enough where we, when we all came to Africa and returned to Africa, then, then, then by necessity, you, told, you tell really local stories, right? The, the how much, you know, I, 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 the writer of Genesis knows about the world from Egypt to the Eastern side of, uh, sorry, the Western side of India. That's what he calls world. So, so uh, what happens to Christianity in the Middle Ages? Uh, if, you, if you think this is, if you tell this story, you have no recourse to, uh, to uh, what happens at the same time in India. A little later, yes, but then not, because it's, these are two, two different stories. So the same thing with technology, right? If what we're bothered is with the, the, the local, the, the current, state of using a, a, a technology to technocratically a, a empower and enrich some and disempower and uh, impoverish others. This is a really, a, a, it's really, really, really interesting topics. But is it, do we as historians of science have anything new, important, revealing to say about this or is it for history of politics of post-colonial of, of economy and so on when i uh, if is this this their job when i talk about the relation between science and technology for for you know the, the stuff that happened back then i look at moments 
were, were uh, 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 you know, the, the moments with, with, that I didn't write only a textbook about, but I wrote uh, all my, my career, moments where, where it becomes obvious uh, that the way to look at nature is only through art, that only technology, and this is a philosophical kind of shift, only technology tells us what really happens in the untechnologized, right, the naked, naked, uh, uh, naked world. I think this is where uh, history of science need to contribute its own. I need, need to do something which is unique. That's uh, where Simon keep pushing us, which is unique to the history of of science, right? So, like we can use we can use science, the word science, in this expensive way to cover every type of knowledge and do like a comparative history of knowledge. Fair enough, a reasonable and and respectable, honorable occupation. Is it a history of this particular thing, is it really a history or, or just a, 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 you know, a, a flat, flat in sense of horizontal comparative world? Same thing about technology. Do we want to call a, a, a every use of art, of artificial means, a technology, and then they just say, okay, they developed the, the ratchet there and a, 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 500 uh, years before, or the clock was the, 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 the escapement. There was an escapement in China in the 11th century. And then there is an escapement in Europe in the 14th century. Is there a history of escapement? Do they relate? I rather, I'm, my word, <laughs> this is not a recommendation. I rather keep them apart. Tell the history of this and tell the history of that. If they meet, that's a, then an interesting story. But if they don't meet, I, I would not like to tell a history of the escapement, um, but rather the history, for example, of in a particular place, at a particular time, one thinks that if you look with your eyes at an at a ant or at the, at the moon, you don't see anything. You've got to put something in between. This is a moment which is unique in the story to a historian of science, I think. That's a, that's a fine place to be at this point in the discussion, a kind of Vitruvian uh, middle order, I think, is definitely the recipe. Now, folks, um, we've now been going for an hour, and we were granted an hour, but I'm going to infringe the hour um, because there's an incoming question that I really think it would be very apt to close with. Um, if you were starting again, I mean, it's a, this is supposed to have been a conversation about the future of our field and um, what with the climate crisis and the way in which the relation between knowledge and politics is going, I think we're being wildly optimistic simply to take it for granted that the field has a future, but let's assume that the, that the field has a future and that it should have a future. If you were starting again, your uh, active, reasonably healthy person, your a world citizen, somehow you've escaped the ferocity with which travel is now treated, and you can in fact become enrolled as a student and researcher. What topic are you going to work on that will contribute most significantly to the future of the field of the history of science? That I find an absolutely riveting question, right? Um, I should point out that this is a question which itself, of course, has a history. Um, Holmes and Watson discussed it at 221B Baker Street in one of the rather unsatisfactory Conan Doyle stories um, about what Holmes would have done if he hadn't been a consulting detective. Um, so, Gabriella, uh, 
you have your time over again and it starts now, what are you going to work on? Um, that's a great question. I think I would work on rivers, on histories of rivers, because that is a great site from which to understand convergence of uh, populations, but also of ideas. It's attempts to control water through hydraulic technology, but it's also um, where nature often wins out and destroys the built environment. So I think if I were to go again, it would be um, looking at water, at the movement of water and how water defines us because in this climate changed world, I really think that we need a better understanding of how of human relationship and in particular science and technology relationship with water, what we have done right and also what we have done wrong. That's a completely brilliant idea. Um, I would fund it. I mean, if I would fund it, I would, I would fund it. Well, thank you, Simon. I... So uh, kind of Amazonian history of science in every sense of that word. That's fantastic. Project. That's a tough one, but I think I'll, I'll invoke that great cultural classic of our times shot in parts in Pennsylvania, uh, Groundhog Day. And say that I do exactly the same. Thing. You do exactly the same. Wouldn't you? I would. Yeah, I would. You would. <laughs> For those of you who don't know what that means, what that means is that we get another version of nationalizing the body, right? <laughs> and that would be fantastic. I would read that. Okay. Any of you who have not read Nationalizing the Body, read the book. <laughs> so you would do that again. I would, because I do think that there's one of the things that those of us who work on empire and uh, modern science, the chronology of modern science, to a large extent, of course, overlaps with empire. And that, that means that there have been these overlapping conversations that Absolutely. we have rightly produced a lot of scholarship on uh, colonialism, but we haven't produced nearly as much on nationalism as we need to do. Uh, and I think these questions of technocracy, once again, um, point towards that, the rise of uh, this extreme nationalism across the planet today, and it's very complex relationship with science, like, you know, even the, those who deny climate change, or those who deny evolution, they also invoke the sign of science, at least, and they, they don't say that it's necessarily it's just in my head. They're like, oh, it's in the Bible. But you see, there are these studies that the establishment doesn't want you to see, which is validating this. So I think there's a, like, really, there's a lot more to unpack there. And the amount of time we've rightly spent on empire, we haven't spent nearly as much on nationalism and what it's done. Whereas this is, unfortunately, a, if you look at the few sort of what's happening globally, geopolitically, there are so many countries are now ruled by these techno-populists that I think mm, the relationship between nation and science is definitely, and technology is something that definitely needs more work. Super, oh fair. I don't know if it, I should thank you for giving me more time. This is a very, very scary thought. Uh, quite a lot of things I would have done and uh, knew differently, but uh, but just to uh, <laughs> to answer this, it's not Breaking Bad, Doctor Gal. I uh, mean, no? you know, you know, come on. Because there were chances. The, yeah. The, what I would go, you know, again, I, maybe the the impression I get, I would really, I would go a a, a little back in time, <laughs> and uh, and I would go. There are two uh, like moments of meetings between uh, uh, between cultures which uh, which I really really kind of uh, excite me and I, I know nothing about it I don't think many know one is uh, the the Mongol era of uh, like these 80 years where uh, where you know Marco Polo can go from one side of the of the you know landmass to the other and and uh, I, I think we know next to nothing I have a story about in the book which I found, you know, taking a bit of this, a bit of that, that the, the crisis that bring Copernicus happens in China as well. It happens in China because the Chinese are doing, uh, the, the, in, the, in the Ministry of Rights, they're doing Greek Hellenistic uh, 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 um, um, astronomy. Why do they do, uh, how did they get there? Well, the Arabs brought it, or the Muslims. Why the Muslims? 
because of Kublai. Why Kublai wants the Muslims? Because he doesn't trust the local Chinese. So he brings a, a, a experts from his brother, who is an astronomer in Kazakhstan, who is a kind of, among other things, an amateur astronomer. He brings them and, and Tusi gets to live in, uh, in China for 300 years uh, uh, alone. And another place, so this is, uh, we're talking 13th century, 13th, 14th century, or uh, 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 another is the, the, uh, the, the trade between India, China, and Japan, which is done on European boats, right? The, Euro the, the Dutch take over by, by violence those ancient trade routes, and they now run it on Western technology, but if with completely local, or not completely, somewhat local, who knows, with local crews, what language did they speak? So what, what, how did they, uh, what, some, some dialect of, uh, of local Indian, Indonesian? No one knows. I, I couldn't find anyone that knows. So if I knew all these languages, maybe that's, that's where I would uh, go, right? This is a meeting of the local and the global, if you like. A, a, a particular a local meeting of the local and the global, and which uh, which are very curious about. Okay, that's magnificent. We've run out of time. Um, I have a few apologies, first of all, uh, to amongst others, and in no particular order, Robert Proctor, Minakshi Menon, Warwick Anderson, and Helen Tilly, whose excellent questions we either didn't get to at all or we ignored or we'll come back to if they let us do this again which i kind of hope they do because uh, i enjoyed it a lot and i hope you all did as well um i'd like to thank our global audiences for just being there even though we can't see you um or indeed mainly hear from you um i'd especially like to thank joanna berry from cambridge university press who hey, hey. has made this possible um and whose energy and support and skill along with those of the cup team has been completely amazing and uh, I should mention on behalf of CUP that if you want to find out more about any of the Cambridge publishing projects that we've talked about, then uh, there'll be links in the chat and uh, there'll be links circulated afterwards by email because you're now part of surveillance capitalism, whether you knew it or not. <laughs> um finally this has been recorded so you'll be able to access this on i think it's a youtube cup site and um i'd like to thank you uh as john and paul once said on behalf of the band and i hope we pass the audition uh <laughs> so from cambridge Good evening from Sydney. Good morning um, from the East Coast of the United States, uh, whatever it is. Good afternoon, I guess. Um, and uh, have a great time over the next period. And please stay safe and well, because we're thinking of you all. Bye.